That's the big news today. Uh, Gronkowski told the Patriots he wanted to come back, but he wanted to come back playing for the Bucs with his buddy Tom Brady. So they made the trade. You heard what the uh, specifics are. And now let's bring in our good friend Bart Scott, um, part of the duo of Bart and former friend of the show, Alan Hahn. You could hear them one to three every single day right before our show on 98.7 ESPN. Bart, how you doing, my friend? Oh, no. I'm out of, man. Couldn't be better. I'm here, Brody. We all good. There he is. There you go. You know how it is. Multitasking this dad time. I'm trying to season chicken, get the other one to take the trash down, get the other one to do the dishes. They're not used to working in tandem because they're used to the bait. They're used to the nannies and everybody coming and clean the house. Now oh, wait, everybody that's... else, they got to do some real damn work. That's amazing, Bart. You're able to deal with your family, multitask, and answer a phone call from the Michael K show. Hmm. Well, I always got time for the case. Y'all my peeps, man. Remember where it all wow. began. You know, forget all the right. other stuff the other company I worked for. Remember where it started. That's right. It started as a call-in. We all come from humble beginnings, man. Everybody can't get that hot 9-7 job like you got coming out the, wow. out the, out the gate to be a, be a, a high-priority free agent, you know what I'm saying, up in the sports world. So what, all right, so what was, like what's, the what's your initial team? take on, on Gronkowski going to the box? I mean, it's just like like most people probably assume. His body was hurting. What happens is you try and do other things in your life, and nothing gives you the satisfaction of uh, playing football. And then the opportunity to, to kind of play and let your hair down with a coach that's going to provide a different type of atmosphere. I think everybody that played in New England for a long time longs for the opportunity to be able to play and just have fun and come to an environment that the, the, the environment is fun and everybody's loose because there are more than one way to win. Now, they've been successful in winning the way that they have over the years, but you heard what, you know, Philadelphia, when they won, and you talk about, um, you know, Long, uh, Kyle Long, and talking about, not Kyle, I forget which one it is. There's so many of them. Chris. You know what I mean? But, you know, Long and what Chris. he said about, you know, his experience in New England and then the joy in which he had, just the environment and the looseness of playing, you know, for Philadelphia. So I think this is an opportunity for Grant to kind of go and be loosey-goosey and have fun. So I think even though he had a huge smile on his face, I don't think he was super excited about jumping off the top rope looking like a fake nacho man, Randy Savage. So you don't think he comes back if Brady stays in New England? Oh, not at all. Not at all. I mean, this is about him coming back and playing with his friend in a fun environment. Now, from a Tampa Bay standpoint, now you have some decisions to make because I believe O.J. to – O.J., the um, juice man, is down there, and you also have Cameron Brake. So they have their two tight end sets. And if they're going to come and try and absorb that $10 million uh, salary, I think, you know, they're going to have to let somebody go because they don't have a lot of cash to begin with. So, you know, watch for either Cameron Brake or I, I can doubt if it's going to be O.J., the juice man, because he's the younger of the two, kind of being on the block because you, you can't have a three tight end set, even though they have tremendous – playmakers all around to, to kind of, you know, be able to compliment that, you know, you really, when you go three tight end sets, you're basically playing with one receiver. With what Godwin did last year and what Evans does, there's no way you're taking those guys off the field. I'll tell you what, Bart, if you look at that offense, that, that might be one of the um, most weapon-heavy offenses that Tom Brady's ever played in. Well, um, I, I think the, the one that was the most difficult, oddly enough, to stop was the one that had, you know, Gronk, Hernandez, and Algie Crumpler because that personnel package forces you to go heavy. And when you go heavy, they basically had two receivers playing tight end, which when you look at it, they will have three tight ends playing, you know, receiver, so to speak, because OJ is not a great blocker, but we know Gronk is a tremendous inline blocker. And also, you know, that uh, Cameron Bray is a stout blocker, so it could pose a lot of questions, but they're not going to walk away from Godwin, who had a career year. They're not going to work away from, from Evans, who's one of the top ten receivers in the game. Um, that just tells you exactly what they're going to do on the offensive side. they got to go left tackle now because you can have all those great players. You put Grunk on the right side, he's going to be tremendous in the run game as well. That allows you to protect Tom Brady's backside and gives him the opportunity to process and go through all different types of reads and giving him the opportunity to burp the baby. And now you have these tremendous receivers on the outside. I mean, I could see them if they decide to stay with this whole package with the three tight ends. I can see them going with the personnel with no running back in the game and daring you to figure out what to do. Wow. All right, let's what does burp the, the baby mean? I'm sorry. I need help. That's when you stand Well, burping the baby is football. when a quarterback ha has time to sit back in the pocket and he's 
Oh, he, he's pass. weighing his options so he yeah, can yeah, pass yeah, the it, ball it. like burping a baby. Yep, got it. Okay. I know you got a dog. I know you got a dog. So I I'm slow, but I, I get it now. Got it. Okay. And the, the Jets have a quarterback at Sam Darnold. Didn't have a lot of time to burp the baby. So at 11, are you going oh, offensive he dropped the baby. line? He dropped the, ba- he dropped the baby and ran for high heaven. <laughs> so do you go offensive line even if Judy's there at 11? You, you definitely go offensive line because you look at, you know, the hardest thing to get in free agency, and it was rare that Conklin was out there. The hardest thing to get, especially in this league, is a tackle. And what's even harder than getting a great tackle is getting a great left tackle. And I feel like depending on what the Giants do, the Jets will have a tremendous opportunity to upgrade that position, which allows you to be able to um, evaluate Sam Darnold and see if he is the truth. He had a step back be it the mono, be it the offensive line, you know, that Baker Mayfield had, you know, so they all had like a sophomore slump. This is an opportunity for him to be able to really solidify his position as a franchise quarterback. Mm -hmm. So if you go get the left tackle, I mean, you can get great receivers. As I've been breaking this draft down, you can get great receivers in the third round. I mean, I've never seen such a deep pool of receivers, and they got big ones, they got fast ones, they got slot guys, they got run after the catch guys. If you think about a guy like Ayuk, or, you know, he's a guy that reminds me of Quincy Anunua. You look at thinking of a guy like uh, Kement from um, from uh, Penn State. He gives you that little guy that can run after the catch. And if you look at, you know, uh, Chase Poole, he gives you that, you know, Calvin Johnson frame, 6'4", 240, vertical receiver. So it's just, it's, it's just you can get whatever you want there. I think this is the deepest position there. We've seen some of the great receivers, whether it's Michael Thomas, you know, whether it's, um, you know, uh, whether it's uh, A.B., these guys come in the later rounds. You can find guys in the later rounds, but don't miss on the hardest position to pay and the hardest position to draft in the left tackle. All right, so then the question about the Giants at four, they're going to have their pick of any of the offensive linemen, the top four, or Isaiah Simmons. Who would you go with? No way I'm going with Isaiah Simmons. Isaiah Simmons, to me, is the jack-of-all-trades and the master of none. You got to have a, a clear and decisive plan for a kid like that. Because is he the best safety? No. Is he the best inside linebacker? I can argue that I'll pick three inside linebackers that, that play the pure linebacker position than I would before I pick Isaiah Simmons. You know, actually, my favorite inside linebacker right now is Willie Gay from uh, from Mississippi. I mean, this guy's tremendous. He runs a four four uh, forty, and he's one of these guys, man, that that hits with the with bad intentions. No, I think no, you know, I don't think we have any concerns. It's, it's been better. I know uh, I've spent plenty of time talking with. Oh no, and, uh, uh, that was a, a misfired. Sorry, Bart. Cut. Sorry, Bart. Okay, okay. I, I, I thought okay. Well, I, I thought I was cut off. Cold, you know, you know, we we got the zoom. We got the zoom stuff going on. I thought maybe the, we we got zoom bombed or something. <laughs> but you know, Willie Gay and also the kid uh, Jordan Brooks, I believe, from Texas Tech. So whoever gets Isaiah Simmons has to identify him. As a, as, a, as a certain position. I think he, he can be elite safety in the Cam Chancellor mode, but if you get into this mode of thinking that he's an inside linebacker and you're going to move him all around, then he's not going to be able to master any of these positions and learn the minute details because every position that you put him in, whether you want to rush him from the outside, you want to put him in the inside, or you want to put him in safety, he's going to have to – you can have – he can see three plays totally different depending on how he's lined up because what his keys are. So I mean, it's great to be great at a lot of stuff, but you got to be or good at a lot of stuff. But you got to be great at something in this league because everybody's good at something. Or they wouldn't be here. Well, what what I guess the big compliment I hear from him, and, and, and certainly what I loved in the three four, and I'm not comparing him to Lawrence Taylor, is is that you could put him put him anywhere in the three four, and that the feeling seems to be in this modern NFL defense is this is the player that that jack of all trades is perfect for the way teams run defenses. You don't buy that in this day and age? No, I do, but I wouldn't offer five different positions to this kid. You know what I mean? I think he can be, he can be a weapon, but you can, you can get your offensive tackle. If I'm the Giants, you can get your offensive tackle. You can go to the second round, which is a high pick. And, um, and I know people are going to say, well, this guy goes to Southern Illinois, so that's why you like him. But if you look at Jeremy Chin, he offers you the exact same thing from a safety come down and play your dime linebacker and a tremendous blitzer, you know, for a second round draft pick. So you can get the best of both worlds. Now this kid is actually six four as well, just like Isaiah Simmons. He's two twenty four. So that means if you need him to add on 
you know, seven more pounds. He's 230, so he's perfect for a wheel linebacker slash safety, but he ran a 4-4 as well. So he is, that's why Gettleman has to do his due diligence and go through the process and understand what's the best combinations of players I can get. Not just what's the best player I can get, because that first round you can get a great player, but you should be able to try and find a great player in the second round as well. And players that complement what Daniel Jones do, but also offers what you can get from a standpoint of being dominant in a 3-4. And I feel like you can get that from Jeremy Chin because he offers you the same things that Isaiah Simmons does, but he offers you that at a cheaper price in the second round. We're talking with Bart Scott, um, one half of Bart and Han. You can hear them one to three right before our show every single Monday through Friday from 98.7 ESPN. Uh, So would you look at Tua Tagovailoa and say it's a huge gamble to take him because of the hip injury and they haven't been able to really look at him medically? Yeah, but no risk, no reward. You know what I mean? You know, you have you have to sometimes evaluate and see where you're picking. It depends on where you're picking and what your backup quarterback situation is. Do you have a guy in place like a Ryan Fitzpatrick, like a Tyrod Taylor, that if you miss, see, it's not the penalty that it used to be if you strike out on a on a quarterback. It used to be the quarterback came in, he was picked in the top five, top three. He was the highest paid player, arguably in his position. It's the old Sam Bradford rule. When he came in, he became the highest paid player of the position. Now you can get out of these contracts relatively easy, you know, not, not without being unscathed, but the, the talent is there. And you think even if he comes back and he gives you four great years, it gives you opportunity to build a team around him at a very cheap cost. You know, that's how teams are winning now. Teams are winning because they're either, one, they have a franchise quarterback that's a force multiplier that can make up the holes like a Russell Wilson, like a Tom Brady, or you're going with a guy like Mahomes that, although he is a franchise quarterback, or you look at um, Carson Wentz who, on a rookie contract, it allows you to go out and get higher guns and put so many weapons around him that his chances of failing are, are low. It's all about risk management. So whoever's going to pick you know, Tua could get a great player, and maybe he's a great player for 10 years, or maybe he's a good player for five years. But if I'm a general manager, that's good for me because my life expectancy in the league, if I don't win, it's probably about three to four years. How much of a disadvantage are some of those late round players by the way that they are doing the draft now, not getting a chance to talk to these guys, not having the pro days? Are there going to be some guys that are just going to miss the boat and not get drafted because of what's going on right now? Yeah, it's brutal. And, you know, I was one of those guys, right? I was the guy that got the invite. Um, but teams were able to come out and come to my pro day and see what I was and see what I could be and, and put me on the board and talk to me. You know, I look at these small schools of guys that didn't get invited to the combine. They're not going to have the opportunity to have an interview, to get opportunity to even know that they exist. They're not going to get opportunity to show the, how they gain weight, to show that, hey, they play faster than what it looks like on film, to be able to put a time there they can't put a 40 up they can send videos and, and video chat and you know and talking to joe douglas and talk to some other guys you know just in talking you know we feel that that's going to be the people that get left out and without the xfl even being in existence they don't even have a place to go prove themselves you know maybe the canadian league to prove themselves to try and show what they can do with elevated competition i'm curious be, before we let you go bart so it, it seems like brady wanted no part of belichick and Gronkowski wanted a part of Belichick. Would you have rather mm-hmm. been on a team and had a good time with a relaxed atmosphere, a good team, or would you rather have been miserable and win a Super Bowl with Belichick? Miserable and win a Super Bowl with Belichick. Uh, yeah. But the thing is, all these guys have gotten that, so now right. it's like one of those things. Once you've got your titles, now you can do what you want to do and have fun and, and try and go at both. Right? And you can, you, both can be possible. You can have fun and win championships. I mean, just look at that 2000 Baltimore Ravens team. You saw, you saw the, you saw hard knocks before the season started. They had a blast. Mm-hmm. You know, you saw, we saw that underdog Philadelphia team. They had a blast. But when you've already gotten it, you know, that's why you can look at Kevin Durant and he say, you know, I got my titles. So now my resume is complete. I mean, is Brady really going to up his resume by going to win a Super Bowl uh, with Tampa? Eh, it may, it may take it up a point, but. His, his, his legacy is already cemented. So now Grunk gets to go and act like a crazy, crazy person, have fun in a loose environment. If he wins, he wins. And if he doesn't, he's still a three-time Super Bowl champion. He's still a first ballot Hall of Famer. He's still in the top 100. So now he's like, man, I can go actually have fun with my friend, and I know that we're going to be successful, and it's a team that possibly could win. I mean, 
that, do you, do you think me, with, that checks all the boxes and those state with, taxes. Do you think with guys like that, yeah, exactly, with the taxes, but do you think with guys like that, there's an excitement of like we can actually go down there and rule the rule the roost. It'll be our team in a way that you just can't feel in New England because it's always Belichick's team. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I can actually show my personality off. I know Grunk always did, but I actually can say what I feel. I mean, Tay, you understand this. You get to a point when you age, you get to a certain age, but you just ain't having it. You just ain't holding your tongue. You ain't got time to waste time. You tell people exactly how you feel. You're direct. You do what you want to do. I think Brady's at that point where I do what I want to do. I'm going to have fun. I'm going to be demanding. I'm going to be a diva if I want to do that. If I want Gronkowski, even though you got two Pro Bowl tight ends, guess what, damn it? I want, I want Gronkowski. And either you do it or, you, or this isn't going to go the way you want because you need me more than I need you. See, I thought it was maybe different. It was always a, hey, maybe I don't need you as much as I need you. Maybe I, I can get uh, um, Jimmy G or maybe I can get somebody else. I don't, maybe it was questions there. But I think he wants to go there as well. And we've seen, listen, if anything, the last dance has taught us is that being successful is about managing egos. It's usually somebody pride and ego that gets in the way that wants more credit than what they deserve or they feel like they're not getting. Somebody feels slighted. And I feel like Brady feels like he's been slighted. And he feels like, you know, Bill thought that he wasn't that important. Well, guess what, Bill? Go ahead and try and win with Jared Stidham. Good luck with that. And then guess what? If it doesn't go your way, because before me, you weren't winning no titles. Right before me, you weren't having a success. You, matter of fact, before me, your job was on the line. So how about let let me prove to everybody and let me end the debate. Let me end the, and let me prove it to myself that I can go somewhere else and be successful. And Bill, you're later in age, so you only got a couple more swings at the apple. You can't afford another ten years of not winning a title like you went between our first dynasty and then our second one. So then, if I win, it proves no different from why Co- why Shaq left Kobe. Right? Eagles always get in the way. I'm I'm curious about one thing. You know everybody in the NFL. Are you friends with people that played for New England, and is it no fun whatsoever, Bart? It is the worst thing ever. I know plenty of people. I can name Adelius Thomas, Marquise Cole. I can name names. I got receipts of people that I played with at other places, and Adelius won the Super Bowl with uh, the, the, the Ravens. He went to New England, and he, and he played well in the Super Bowl. They lost. He absolutely hated it. Really? What What's bad about it? Well, what, what you... It's miserable. It's no fun. Like, dude, just berate you. I mean, they got conditioning afterwards. You know what I mean? You saw that. You see, all you have to do is to see how uh, a glimpse of what New England's like is look at all the, the rumblings of you hear the assistants that come and try and create that same environment other places. The only reason you can do that in, in that environment in New England is because the best player on the team buys in and allows you to do that. No different than how Tim Duncan and, and, and David Robinson allow Popovich to do that to them. Well, but now, Kawhi Leonard was like, listen, Kawhi Leonard was like, you ain't going to be talking to me like that. You know what? I'm out. Peace. How about that? I- I'm curious what you think uh, of Joe Judge then. You know, I've made a big thing out of the fact that he will not say any player's name. He's trying to be Belichick without the trophy. So what do you think of something like that? What do the players think when the coach refuses to utter their name? I mean, think, he, think he's a clown. He's an ass. Like, dude, who are you trying to prove? First of all, you have to prove yourself to us because we don't know nothing about you, bro. We don't even know if you, if you qualify. I mean, we don't even know if you deserve our respect. You have to earn our respect. At least some of those other guys were coordinators that had success at doing certain things. So, like, at least they have a resume that we can know. We don't even know your resume. So you guess guys what? do that one. The players notice it. They, they, they want him to say Daniel Jones' name. They're, they're like, come on, man. Really, is this what we're going to do? Is this what we're going to spend our energy and our time on? You acting like you don't know that Saquon Barker is going to be your starting running back. Right. Like, come on, man. You quit wasting our time, wasting time. Let's focus on the stuff we got to worry about, about, like, actually trying to win some games, build a team, learn an offense. Really? You, 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 who do you think you are, Yoda? You playing Jedi mind trick? Man, kill yourself. And, and listen, <laughs> that's strong. Uh, it's it's but, not literal, not literal. But Right. No, I understand yeah, yeah, yeah. that. But, but yeah, Bart, what would you do? Yourself. You know, obviously what he's trying to do is he's trying to say that, that all players are created equal. But did you want that? in the environment, or did no. you want the pecking order of, hey, there's a starter, there's a star, there's a leader, that's a guy that I want to get to that level, or did you want to walk into a room believing that you were looked upon the same way as everybody else on the team? Bro, don't lie to me. When keeping it real goes exactly. wrong. Brian Billick was, you know, you know people, people don't understand how great Brian Billick was. Right? He was this offensive genius that couldn't get an offense in Baltimore, but he still found a way to win. How did he find a way to win? Because he knew how to manage egos. First day, he tells you, listen, I'm going to teach all you guys fairly, none of you the same. 
because I'm lying to you because we know life ain't fair. It's like me telling my kid it can be fair. You know what I mean? It's like my dad telling me that I could be president. Until Barack Obama, I was going to tell my dad he was full of, you know what? Like, don't listen. Be honest with me. We're grown men, right? And the great coaches understand that your, your future and my future are linked together. So, listen, yeah, first I can fire you, but eventually if I fire enough players, they're going to come fire me. So, listen, our success is intertwined. So I want you guys to understand that we're going to create an environment of competition, accountability, and we're going to keep it real. I ain't going to lie to you, bro. If you, if you, if you, if you want to ask me why you ain't playing, because you suck. Or if you want to ask me why you're playing, it's because, listen, this guy, I got to play this guy first. You know what I'm saying? And we got to see what he got. He's going to get more opportunities. That's like, that's like me coming to the Baltimore Ravens. And I'm a rookie undrafted from Baltimore. And they're like, hey, man, this is an open competition between you and Ray Lewis. I'm like, you know what? I, I can't even do it. I can't even do it with this one. Because y'all, if y'all had lied to me like that, you know, y'all had lied to me and, tell, and, and cut me. Like, I'm not even going to fall for that banana in the tailpipe. Deuces. I'd rather go somewhere else with somebody else and tell me the damn truth. You'll get more of this brilliance when uh, Bart and uh, Mike Tannenbaum do the draft on Thursday right here on 98.7. Yeah. And you can hear him every day from 1 to 3 with Alan Hahn right here on 98.7. So, Bart, we love you. Thank you for coming on, man. Hey, man, I appreciate it, man, you know, on, on, uh, and congratulations on number one, you know what I'm saying? You're the man, women. Thank you, you so much. You guys are the women. need for our wings. <laughs> <laughs> you and your You're family stay safe, too, man. <laughs> yeah, keep doing it, buddy. Uh, no, no doubt, no doubt. Have a great day. All right, thank you. That's Bart Scott, and tomorrow we're going to have on Mike Tannenbaum at 5 o'clock, so the other half of uh, Bart and Mike.